what you're looking at in these eight verses when God got to pick a curriculum, when God got to write the curriculum, this is what he wrote. He wrote it very carefully. He wrote it very systematically. He wrote it for us. He chooses 12 vital characteristic qualities of women. And I call them the the 12 godly characteristics for a highly useful woman. Now think about that. The greatest thing that we can be is useful for God. Remember, we are his servants. In fact, this first one, uh, women who are highly useful to God, are the women who are spirit-empowered and who live out this this attitude. And it starts that very first. Look at verse 3. The first characteristic of an older woman in the faith is profiled. And I want you to, to think about the, the sequence here. Without this first characteristic, the others don't matter. Without that reverent behavior, the others will not follow. The life will not speak. It's very, very significant that the beginning is that the older women be reverent in their behavior. If you remember this word drawn from the, the Roman world, the word is actually only used here in the whole Bible. Uh, there are basic, uh, very similar words used interspersed all throughout this, the pastoral epistles, but this word is uniquely here. And this word captures the entire bearing of these godly role model women in the church. Uh, this word translated reverent conveys the idea of priest-like. Now, I just want to take you, we looked at one, but I want to take you to three this evening. We'll start in Romans 12. And I just want to read these for the simple purpose that just the the public reading of God's Word has an effect on us. So start in Romans 12 with me and let me go through this idea of being a priest and a priestess for the Lord. Because if we in Romans 12, 1 and 2 act as a representative of God, then we fulfill the idea behind what Paul's trying to convey here. This idea of reverent behavior starts with a proper view of my relationship in a practical way as I go through life to the Lord. I am to be offered as his servant. Now, we don't have servants nowadays. Uh, That's just not a part of our culture. In fact, it's an abysmal part of our culture. We look back over what happened with slavery in America. But slavery was just part of everyday life in the ancient world. Uh, It was very common. In fact, as I've told you before, there were eight different types of slaves in the New Testament world. Many people, many professions now that we have, professionals, would have been slaves in the first century world. Not all slaves were beaten and mistreated. Many of them were high-ranking officials in, in different parts of the society. They were the lawyers. They were the confidants. They were the financial advisors. They were investors. They were stewards. There were many different kinds of... In fact, a lot of those temple workers that we're talking about even here were slaves, but they had an elevated position. So slavery in our mind is all negative, but in the ancient world it wasn't. And times are different. But the word that Paul uses to describe the believers is that they would be devout and godly in their character. It was not that they were a member of this church, but they live like the devil. It wasn't that, yeah, I've done that. It's, it was something that flowed throughout their whole life. It was a characteristic of their life. They were devout. They were reverent in their behavior, not just at church, not just in discipleship group, not just you know, when they were in their ministry. It just permeated their lives. Romans 12. Godly older women have simply taken, first of all, Romans 12, 1 and 2, as their call to present themselves, to come before the Lord and say, yes, I respond to your request. I present myself as a living, sacrificial offering. I am not my own. I belong to you. Do what you want. Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body, a living sacrifice, your body holy, your body acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't allow yourself, verse 2, to be conformed to the world. And in the, in the context of, of this Titus 2 woman, an older woman would live like a holy priest serving in the presence of God. Their sacred personal devotion to the Lord slowly 
influences every part of their life. They do not allow themselves, Romans 12, 2, to be conformed to this world, but they are progressively being transformed by the renewing of their mind. They are constantly saying, Lord, I want my thoughts, I want my behavior, which is directed by my thoughts. I want that all to be conformed to you, not the world. And that's why they become so powerful in the church, because they can help younger women to see areas that they have been conformed to the world. It's so interesting. I can say something and apply it over here, and it has nothing to do with with someone's life, but a godly older woman can come alongside a younger woman and say, you know what? You know, on Sunday when we were talking about conformity to the world, you probably didn't see it, but you know what? In this area of your life, you have been conforming, allowing the world to squeeze you into its mold. And the younger woman will say, I don't understand. And the older woman will say, well... Look, the scripture says this, it says this, it says this. Now, do you see your response here, here, and here? And that, that setting is the nurturing and it's the discipleship setting that shows them how to renew their mind using the scripture, Romans 12, 2, that you may prove that you can live out what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God so that you can demonstrate, so that you can put into action. It's one thing when it's up here just on the stated verbal truth level. But we're not supposed to merely be hearers, but this is the doer part. And so these Titus two women, reverent in behavior, come alongside and say, this is how the Lord has shown me to be a doer. Now keep going to the next book, 1 Corinthians 6, because the second element of this reverent behavior comes in the last two verses of chapter 6. Remember I said that they're priestesses serving in the temple and that we are the temple? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And because of that, the verse says, and you are not your own. Do you know that? See, Paul is asking a question. He's asking a group of people that knew all about temples and all about being servants. And he says, don't you realize that when you... When you respond to God and offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, you become his living servant. You have died to yourself and you live to him. Now look at the wording of verse 19. Your body becomes his temple. What what was the temple for? It was a place that people went to see their God. You and I are the representation of Christ. We are, do you remember how Paul put it? He says, you're the photographs of Christ. You are the image of Christ. He's written in your heart. You demonstrate Christ. You're living letters, as it were, of Christ. That's what we're to be. We are his temple. We have him living within us, living out through us. And people see Christ through our actions and behavior and are drawn. There's a winsomeness. That's why in Titus it says that the pagans, they'll be ashamed. They, they won't be able to speak evil because they see such consistency. Such Now, they might hate it and they might persecute it, and they did in the Roman world, but often they didn't know how to respond to it because it was so compelling. That's why the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church, that they couldn't kill them fast enough in the Roman Empire. The faster that they killed them, the more people believed because what they said is they know how to live and they know how to die, and we don't, and we want that. We don't have hope. We don't have joy. We don't have peace. We don't have harmony in our homes. We don't have peace in our minds, and they do. And so he says in verse 19, your body is God's temple. He's in you. You have from God. You're not your own anymore. Verse 20, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So there's a great truth. It's just hanging out there. It's kind of like a, a beautiful you know, piece of art. It's just hanging out there. And those early believers heard that. I mean, they actually heard Paul say that. And they would go, wow, just like we do. Wow. And then they'd, they'd say, now I've got to go back you know, to making chariots, or I have to go back to trampling out grapes tomorrow in the vineyard. And they could not connect the wonderful truth they got with where they were and how they could live that out. And so that's why these godly older women were deployed. And they would say to them, this is how, verse 20, you glorify God in your body. 
And then when we get down for wives, how to love their husbands, do you remember that in the ancient world, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but in the ancient world, marriage was a convenience to have legitimate heirs and to have someone you trusted at home to watch over everything. There was nothing romantic about marriage uh, as, as a whole in the ancient Roman world. Men found their, their companionship, their emotional intimacy, and their physical intimacy outside of marriage. And so when they got saved, they didn't immediately know how to express genuine love to their wives. They didn't know how to express genuine emotional and psychological and, and needs that these women had. In their, they, didn't, they didn't relate to them. They were just the one who was supposed to cook and take care of the kids and have the kids and do all that and make sure the house was right. And they had their fun outside. And so he's telling these women, I want to show you how to glorify God in your body what you're supposed to do and in your spirit, how you're supposed to respond and act in your emotions, in your mind, in your attitude. That's what I'm telling you because your spirit and your body belongs to God. And I'm going to train you because I was in a marriage like that with a man just like you have and, and he was insensitive and he was uncaring and unthinking and, and, and even though he came to Christ, he still didn't know how to relate to me and I'll show you how I became his best friend. I'll show you how I got very close to him and how he shared his life with me and then I'll show you how, and they go through the children, how to love children that were raised in that Roman world. And so 1 Corinthians 6 would come alive. I mean, this wasn't just going on in Crete. Uh, this, this truly, this model was the model for the early church. That's why we call 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus the pastoral epistles. This is the model, the structure. This is what Paul was training and teaching to be done in the churches. It wasn't just Crete that had this highly developed Titus 2 woman and man with younger men and younger women going on. It was to be throughout the church. This is how they trained and so Corinth, when Paul spoke these words, they would have been followed up with by older and godly men, showing young men how to present their bodies to the Lord, how to be a living, walking temple. And they'd say, you know what? Maybe on your way to work you shouldn't go by the gymnasium. Do you know what gymnasium means? I've told you many times. You know in biology that there are angiosperm seeds and gymnosperm seeds. And angiosperm seeds are covered and the seeds are hidden. And gymnosperms, they're not. A gymnasium was a place where you didn't cover your body to do your athletics. And you know, I think by about the 2012 Olympics, they probably won't wear any clothes. I mean, it's less every time. I mean, they just were headed the Greek way. But in the Greek world, they did all of their athletic events completely naked. And that's why homosexuality was so rampant in the Greek culture. And so Paul, teaching this, and when these new converts that were so used to that, that they weren't even phased by the immorality, when they came to Christ, they had old habits. And so their godly mentor would come along and say, hey, if you want to glorify God in your body, you shouldn't go to the baths. You shouldn't go to the gymnasium or whatever it took for them to cultivate godliness and it had to be explained to them and, and modeled for them. But keep going to the right, to Galatians 2, because there's a third element that these godly women would have been living out. Romans 12, presenting themselves back to God. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, realizing their body was God's temple and that temple was to glorify God in both body and spirit. But Galatians 2.20 which we know so well, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. They realized that Christ was living in them and out through them. And so Paul would teach that. This was a sermon. He preached to the churches of Galatia, the, the churches of his missionary journey. And so he told him, he says, you're crucified. The, when Christ died on the cross, you died on the cross. When Christ was buried, you were buried. When he rose, you rose. And, and he went through all of that and said, the result of this is that Christ lives in you. And the life that you live, you live for him who died for you and gave himself for you. And all the people, there's another wonderful, whoa, truth. And then they went back to working in the leather shop, dyeing things and, and working, sewing things and being servants here and there. And they were trying to figure out, how do I do that? 
they didn't have the portable, you know, we forget nowadays that we can drive around and listen to stuff in our cars and we can listen to our personal digital devices and we can carry around all these materials which are wonderful, but sometimes they're a substitute for what God really intended. He didn't intend for someone that couldn't see what you're doing for you just to listen to him and sort out what you want and what you don't. Back then, they had a living person that came alongside of them and said, you've been crucified with Christ. You're dead to that. There should be a decreasing frequency of anger in your life. I see anger. There should be a decreasing frequency of impatience in your life. The fruit of the Spirit, fruit, is alive and it's growing. And there should be a growing joy in your life. I don't see that. I mean, can you imagine just sitting here right now? What would you think of having someone next to you saying that to you? You'd look at them and you'd say, really? And they'd go, mm-hmm. Just the way you just responded to your husband. That's not loving. Really? Yes, I'm serious, and I'm praying with you about it. And, I, and you need to yield that part of your life to the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine how fast people grew like that? This person's around them. They know them. They see them regularly. That was the ministry of these Titus II women in the early church, pointing them that Christ lives in you. Okay, let's go back to Titus 2.3, because I never want to get far from the text. And I want you to see in Titus 2, in verse 3, the first part, that these... Godly older women could not be godly older women until, number one, they were reverent in their behavior, until they had the demeanor, the, the bearing, the attitude of life that they were the living, breathing priests, priestesses of God. And so they presented themselves to the Lord, Romans 12.1. They began to live a new life the way God asked them to live, not conformed anymore, actively saying no to conformity to the world, transformed minds, walking temples of God, consecrated priests of God, living sacrifices, servants of the Lord. That's the first one. Godly women seek to be reverent in their behavior.